speaking at the Chicago School, um, and I am presenting with Lauren. I'll let Lauren introduce herself. Hi, I'm Lauren Roberts. I am a registered mental health counselor intern in the state of Florida, and I'm also a um, counselor education and supervision PhD student at the Chicago School. So we're going to be talking about ethics and trauma-informed care. So kind of thinking about what is our scope whenever it comes to ethics? What is our scope whenever it comes to trauma-informed care? Um, what are some of the things that we need to consider throughout our education, throughout our training, throughout licensure, throughout beyond, throughout continuing education credits even after we graduate? Um, so our presentation is going to be focused a lot on um, talking about what is trauma-informed care, um, looking at specific ethical codes and what are our ethical and legal obligations whenever it comes to trauma-informed care. Um, we're going to look at what does it mean to even be trauma-informed, like what, what is that term, how do we do that, why is it important for us in all of our roles throughout the time between the moment we enter into our master program until we are retired, um, what it looks like, how we apply that for clients. So kind of from our perspective in our role, what does that look like? Um, and we're also going to talk about what it means for the field and what it means moving forward. If anyone has any questions throughout, we will stop and ask questions at the end. Um, but throughout, if you have questions, just throw them in the chat. We're, we're looking at it. We can, um, we can kind of watch. All right, so what is trauma-informed care? So this is something I've been really passionate about, um, you know, educating people on, because it's something as counselors that we need to be very mindful of, especially working with clients who have trauma. Um, so the definition of trauma-informed care is, it's an approach to a service delivery that considers that all individuals and clients we're assessing may have experienced a trauma in, um, in the past or currently. So there is a risk of harm occurring in care and that it can be delivered in a, it could be sensitive um, trauma and minimize harm. So we wanna make sure that we are being sensitive to the possibility of a history of a traumatic event and being able to acknowledge how to assess and further, um, and further go on with um, assessing and diagnosing and treating the client. So trauma is also associated with um, emotional regulation, hypervigilance to threat, heightened distress, and coping strategies, which, you know, when we think of coping strategies, we sometimes automatically think to healthy coping strategies, but, you know, prior, there might be some unhealthy coping strategies, such as um, disassociation from um, the present self. So we want to make sure we're mindful of any kind of unhealthy coping skills the client might be experiencing. So um, events and situations to be considered traumatic, that's gonna be in the next slide that we're going to be looking at. It's gonna list a couple of different traumas that um, clients may have encountered or could encounter. So trauma-informed care really did start in the um, late 1900s and early 2000s, so it's still pretty new and um, still trying to be more aware of what we can do to approach it with our clients. So being trauma-informed uh, trauma informed means allowing there to be a safe space so we can eliminate any further trauma or, you know, re-traumatizing a client who's already been, um, who's already been traumatized and we want to make sure we approach them in the correct way so we don't cause more re-traumatization than they've already experienced. So again, we want to be aware of the possible history of a trauma, and we want to allow the, um, us as clinicians to promote a safe, trustworthy, and collaborative empowerment and choice for the client. So, um, you know, a lot of the times it, the client has a traumatic event and it's unresolved trauma. Um, so there could be multiple emotional, mental, and physical illnesses associated with it. Um, and there's some, you know, can be some unresolved coexisting disorders like anxiety, depression, substance use, and a lot of the times um, negative core self-beliefs, which I know we will touch on further. So that's just kind of the opening of what trauma-informed care is. 
I think one of the things that um, I think it's important for all of us to think about is, you know, many of us at this presentation are in all different areas of the program, the field. And so I think it's important to think about, like, when did I first even recognize that trauma informed care was a thing? Right. Like, when did we first learn about it? Um, I know from my own experience, I really don't remember it really being talked about at all when I was in my master's program. It really kind of wasn't something that um, really was something that I remember. Um, it really wasn't until I got into the workplace where, um, you know, we got a, a, the, the agency that I work for got a grant um, and they really implemented like really good trauma-informed care. And I did train the trainer. So I was part of that process. Um, and then the grant went away and then they were kind of like, eh, we don't really care about trauma-informed care anymore. So um, it's interesting to kind of think about, and we're going to talk about ethics, but we're going to, it's interesting to kind of just begin to think about when did I really understand that trauma-informed care was a thing, like was something that I needed to be aware of. So these are the different examples of the traumas. So we have betrayal trauma, domestic trauma, forced displacement trauma, historical trauma, military trauma, moral trauma, poly trauma, system-induced trauma and re-traumatization, refugee and or war zone trauma, medical trauma, toxic toxic stress and more, which a lot of these, um, I honestly was not aware of prior to researching them. So it's interesting to acknowledge all the different types of traumas and know that, you know, we're all still learning and we're all still, um, learning about different, different aspects of our field and wanting to continue to be educating ourselves and being aware of all the different traumas. And think about, you know, which one of these stood out to you? You know, which one of these did you really not, were you not aware of? Um, you know, I know when Lauren and I were putting this together and, and I saw the slide, I was kind of like, what is some of these things, you know? Um, so it's important to kind of think about when, where are our blind spots whenever it comes to trauma-informed care and not that, and also recognizing that we have them, right? You know, I mean, I'm in the field, we teach, we learn, but we have to look out, especially after we graduate and, and we have to seek out continuing education credits and we have to seek out training. What do we wanna focus on? Um, so again, not that, I hope that not all of us might not even know that all of these exist and that's okay, but being able to recognize, hey, where are my blind spots? Where are areas that I might need to further my education or further my training? So whenever we talk about trauma-informed care, we're gonna talk about ethics. And so we talked, I believe it was, it feels like it's been like a week, but it's been since Tuesday. One of the first presentations we had was around professional identity um, and it was around like, what does our field look like? And so ethics are a huge part of our field. They're a huge part of our responsibility as counselors to be able to understand. Um, and also our responsibility. And so the American Mental Health Counselor Association, they talk about our counselor, the, our clinical mental health counselors, their first responsibility is to society. And sometimes I feel like we maybe understand that the our first responsibility is to our clients and that's important, but our clients are part of a larger society. And so society, our job is to really protect and be responsible for what is going on outside of our clients' lives and, and kind of be responsible for what is going on as a whole. Um, and so when we think about trauma, it's usually very, when something large happens on a larger scale, right? Who does that impact first, right? It impacts society and then it's gonna impact our clients and then it's gonna impact us. And so our clients are part of what that is and it kind of just it trickles down to that the last part, which is sometimes us. Um, so whenever we think about what the ethic, our ethical codes are, it's really important to understand it is our responsibility to continue education even after we are licensed, after we graduate. Um, there is really no ACA code specific to trauma-informed care. Um, there isn't any, there really isn't a class that is a required class in a master's program that is a requirement of trauma-informed care. Um, so I, again, whenever we think about our responsibility to the field, it's clearly important, right? Because it's referenced in a lot of these ethical codes that you see here, but it's not, it doesn't stand on its own sometimes. And so sometimes whenever we we have to make it a priority to be able to stand, to have it stand on its own if that's something that we want to practice from that scope. 
So again, it's not that this isn't a possibility, but it's really easy to just say, okay, this is my professional identity and have our blinders on as to, well, that's not something that's important or everyone under, everyone has trauma, but I can, you know, get training and I can under, and I can understand what trauma is, right? Sometimes it's an added layer of being trauma informed. It goes beyond well, I can do cognitive processing therapy and I understand trauma, right? It's it's beyond that. It's more of a, a self-awareness of when every client comes in, what happened to them, right? So that's one of the, the main things of why do we need to have ethics? It's because it's interwoven in a lot of these different codes and it's important. It's important to understand. It's important to, to take into consideration. So whenever we talk about practicing within our scope, what does that mean? What does practicing within our scope look like? And this, everyone's answer that who is here today is gonna be completely different, right? We're all gonna have different answers to what this means. We all work in different populations. We all work with different levels of care. Um, so everyone's answer is going to be different. And sometimes that's a good thing. And sometimes that's a bad thing, but sometimes we need to be aware of what does it mean for our practice? What does it look like for us? Um, and it's important. It's important because everyone has experienced some type of trauma, no matter what it is, no matter if our definition of trauma is different from their definition, their definition of trauma what their perspective is on the situation is completely different than how we perceive the situation. Um, everyone has experienced trauma. And so whenever we think about why won't I be trauma-informed or why am I not trauma-informed, sometimes we don't know the answer to that. Sometimes we don't have, our blinders are on, right? So this, this question of what do I do if I find myself practicing outside of my scope is really difficult because sometimes we don't know until someone tells us. So someone could tell us in supervision. And then that's the other part of, well, sometimes we have to be aware and open for feedback. So we might not always know if we're practicing within our scope, but you know, this little, the graphic here kind of shows the examples of where it is within our scope. And sometimes whenever we're starting out, it's really just like that empathy and that compassion of, I understand where you're coming from. I understand where you have been and where you want to go and where you are now. And so again, we, we don't need to jump into the master's program or in a program anywhere and say, I need to be trauma-informed day one. Like it's a process. It's something that we will learn and we will understand what that means to us. Um, the second part is kind of clinical experience and getting more interpersonal skills. How do you interact with people? How do you respond and how do you respond to clients and what they're telling you? What does your, what's your reactions like? Um, how do you accept feedback and how do you kind of work through supervision whenever you might not have practiced within a trauma-informed care scope of trauma-informed care? And again, I, I think it's important for this you know, for this presentation to understand that we will not always do this, but be able to being aware of why we're not or when we're not and being able to take feedback is so important. Mm -hmm. um, listening and communication skills, again, being able to provide feedback to others, give feedback as we move into licensure, as we move into providing supervision for more individuals. Um, and then the last thing is not last, but not least, but even just kind of having more patience, right? So again, this is a circular thing. These are something that we will constantly work on. This isn't like the linear process that we check one, we got that, we're done, right? This is something that can come up and move around freely. Um, here's, here's just some examples of things that we could do. Um, so looking at how we're diagnosing, looking at how we're, we're the language that we're using around diagnosing some clients that we're, that we're seeing or talking about it to different people. Um, definitely psychoed, looking at different preventions, getting training on different theories or orientations. And we'll talk a little bit about those later that are more effective for specific uh, trauma-oriented diagnosis or trauma-oriented experiences, um, consult with all different people. Um, you know, sometimes I feel like 
we, we get on these islands and we feel like we have to do this on our own, but, you know, just, I say this all the time and this is my own like soapbox, but once we're done getting our license, it doesn't mean that we're done getting supervision. You know, sometimes we all need to consult. We all need to kind of, you know, check in with one another. Um, and research is really important. You know, the more we kind of add to the field and contribute to the field and look at where the limitations are as far as trauma-informed care, you know, that's one of the best ways that we can add to the field and we can understand where our field stands with some of those things. Lauren, did you have anything to add on that last slide? Well, I know I agree, you know, with having to, you know, just continue to consult with others and, you know, have su and seek supervision, you know, we're always, you know, society is always changing and people are always changing. We're starting, you know, learning new things, having new experiences. People are starting to be more open about, you know, who, like who they are, what they feel, what they think. So the field's always growing. So it's always important to be able to you know, hear from other people, hear from, you know, our colleagues' experiences, our mentors' experiences, and gain more education so we can be better for our clients and help them seek whatever they need um, and whatever they came to counseling for. So we kind of talked about why ethics earlier, um, but whenever we talk about ethical issues that come up working with trauma, um, the first and foremost is we, we really want to remember those ethical codes, right? We don't want to do any harm. We want to, our goal is to help. Our goal is not to hurt. Um, but whenever it comes to trauma-informed care, it's a little bit different, right? Because we, we do no harm is sometimes thinking about, we don't want to, we want to avoid re-traumatizing. Mm -hmm. And this can be really tricky because sometimes we don't, again, our, we have a lot of blind spots and sometimes we don't necessarily ask the right questions. And again, that's not a bad thing, but sometimes we have to have more awareness when we're working with trauma because we could easily re-traumatize. And sometimes I've had clients that have had a, a negative reaction to either people in a group and they'll even say, you know, I'm so sorry. Like I had no idea that that would have happened. And it just really remember, it just really reminded me of something or this person's voice reminded me of something that ha had happened to me. And so sometimes there are things that come up that we can't prepare for and we won't be able to prepare for anything, but it's being able to create that awareness of how can I have a conversation with somebody about what happened? What does that mean to them to be able to create, again, create an awareness. So I, I don't want to re-traumatize somebody. That's not our, that's not our goal. Um, we need to be sure that they have accurate diagnosis and specific assessment tools. Um, the DSM has a lot of trauma assessments and PTSD diagnosis that are free. Um, there are a lot of different assessment tools for trauma and just kind of trauma assessment, trauma checklists um, that can be really, really helpful. And again, being able to explain why we're doing that and why we're using assessment tools is so important um, because we don't just want to say, well, this, th I think you have this, so I'm going to do this, right? It's more of, I want to get an idea of how using some of these questions and using what they're asking in these assessments as more of a conversation to get an idea or get a baseline instead of, well, I feel like this person has PTSD, so I'm going to give them this PTSD diagnosis scale, right? It's more than that. Um, and so we want to be, we want to be aware that we ethically have to create an accurate diagnosis and get a, the best understanding of what happened to this client instead of kind of what's wrong with this client. Um, obviously we have to assess for suicide, homicide, and self-harm. Um, it's a little bit different whenever we're, you know, again, that's part of our ethical code, but essentially whenever it comes with trauma, it's still, we, we want to be careful because sometimes the trauma is around some of these things. So we have to be direct, you know, and we have to be honest, but we also want to have a conversation around, this is my responsibility as a counselor to ask you these questions. I know it might be difficult sometimes for you to hear, but let's talk about it in a way that you feel safe. And, you know, we as counselors can get the answers that we need and kind of make sure that we're assessing and we're still being direct. Um, helpful and harmful treatment appro approaches. Again, this is going to be very specific to the client that you're working with. Um, I actually had a client uh, a couple years ago, she was 15 and she, the first day that I met her, 
um, she had really terrible experiences with some of the treatment providers because she was in and out of treatment whenever she was uh, younger. And she was finally at a place where she was able to kind of do an outpatient level of care. And the first thing, the first day I saw her, she was like, I hate CBT and I will not do anything around CBT. Um, and so even if I was like, I feel like CBT would be appropriate, like to me, it might've seen been helpful, but to her, it was 100%, please don't do it. You know, she would talk about how she was forced to do these worksheets whenever she was inpatient and she said it was terrible. And so being able to listen and pivot whenever it comes to, and we're going to talk more about interventions, but being able to kind of understand this is how I would approach this client, but this is not how they, they want to be approached, or this is not how they need to be approached. Um, so being able to kind of understand the differences and what our scope is there um, and practicing within our state laws. So every state has different mandated reporting. Every state has um, different ways that we are mandated reporters every pretty much every state is you know for child abuse if someone's going to hurt themselves or somebody else like those are the three um where i see that varies is sometimes whenever it comes to elder abuse um in certain states we're not mandated reporters i'm in pennsylvania and we are not we don't have to report that um, but if someone has a disability and they have been in a situation then we definitely do have to report that um, so being able to understand where are where the states that you practice, where they stand on some of these things, um, really will help guide you in whenever you get into these situations, you're like, now what do I do? Um, let the ethics and the, the laws kind of guide you within that practice. Lauren, anything you want to add? I think you said it all, but no, definitely it's, you know, knowing your code of ethics, knowing your state laws, you know. Um, knowing your client, it all goes back, honestly, to compassion and listening and, you know, trying to know what your client needs and what your client is asking for. So it's being able to be adaptable and, you know, being able to, you know, avoid harming your client further since they've already experienced a trauma. So it's, you know, allowing that rapport to be built. So, you know, so you can help identify those triggers and help them acknowledge, you know, that you're not going to harm them. You're not, you know, you're going to do whatever you can to help them grow. Okay. So becoming trauma informed. So it's really important that you seek a lot of trainings. Um, as we put, you know, three times trainings, 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 just again, with the continued education, you know, we're ethically responsible for gaining further education and to, our, um, for our careers to help our clients. Um, so, you know, you can go online. There's some on the um, ACA website. There's some, you know, free trainings um, that you can be a part of that focus on trauma. Um, but it's really important to, again, start earlier. Um, I know that's one of our bullet points down there, but, you know, the earlier you start gaining this information, um, especially being in grad school and in your master's program, um, some of you might be um, you know, seeing clients, um, some of you might not even be in practicum yet, but it's important to go ahead and get a foundation of where you are and what you need to know before you go and start working with clients and you get further into the field. So you can practice what you've experienced and what you've learned and kind of see where you might need adjustments or where you might need to, you know, seek further supervision from your supervisor. So then understanding what to screen for. So that's really important is um, being able to visually know, you know, what your client is needing and, you know, from their diagnosis or maybe from, you know, even what they're telling you or what you see from their nonverbal approaches, um, knowing what you need to screen for, for, you know, PTSD and other trauma experiences. And then utilizing screening tools. Um, again, with the screening tools, you need to make sure that you are, um, you're knowledgeable and you have experience with the different assessments used to screen. You know, there's some assessments that you need a lot of training on. So make sure you have the right idea of what assessments you need, the, the, you need to have specific certifications and trainings in. And, you know, if you do have those certifications and trainings, make sure you're up to date on, um, up to date on the, um, what's the word I wanna say? The, um, I guess just up to date on the trainings each year or as long as much as as long as you're able to be um, practicing with that assessment tool. 
And then knowing when, to, when and where to refer. So it's always helpful to have um, referrals, you know, kind of in your back pocket to know who's going to be the best referral for your client. And again, with the consultation, you can consult with other professionals on who's going to be the best person to refer to. Because, you know, if you are found practicing outside of your scope, you know, you're going to need to refer out and, you know, you might need to consult with a supervisor or consult with, was that, where's that directed towards me? Oh, no, I was, she said about the PowerPoint and I was like, yeah, we can include it. Okay, cool. So, um, sorry. So, yeah, so it's again with, you know, consulting with your supervisor and consult with, um, consult with others in your society, you know, such as, you know, having other clinicians that you are, you know, you have a relationship with or psychiatrists or psychologists or nutritionists or, um, you know, physical therapists, people that, you know, you need in your community to refer your clients out to because, you know, like we can't assess for medication. So we'd have to acknowledge that's not in our scope. So we have to refer out to a psychiatrist. Um, then there's the three E's, which I learned, which I thought was really interesting. So um, it's event or events, experience and effects. So knowing that trauma is a result of an event or multiple events um, that are experienced as being harmful or life-threatening that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning um, across domains such as you know, mental health, um, emotionally and physically. And then the four R's. Um, so in order to be trauma-informed, we wanna make sure we realize, recognize, respond, and avoid re-traumatization. So we want to realize, um, you know, how impactful being trauma, you know, how impactful um, a trauma can be on a client um, and recognizing the signs and symptoms of someone that has experienced trauma, um, which can be kind of tricky sometimes. You, you know, you might have to assess um, a little bit longer. Um, and then being able to respond. So being able to integrate all the different knowledge that you have and knowing how to um, respond to that person's trauma and how you want to go further with treatment. And again, with the avoid re-traumatizing, you want to make sure that you are avoiding any kind of traumas, um, re-traumatizing of the client. So being able to, again, recognize the signs and try to avoid. I think one of the things, you know, Lauren mentioned knowing when to refer and where to refer um, and I think this can be really, you know, we want to be trauma informed. But we have to also remember that this can be something that could be re traumatizing, right? So sometimes a lot of individuals, I mean, I know I'm in Pennsylvania and there are wait lists for everybody whenever it comes to prescribers. And so sometimes we might have a person that might need a higher level of care or they might need medication services and their, you know, general PCP isn't prescribing their medications anymore. And so sometimes the idea of just having to find another provider can be so re-traumatizing. And we, you know, this it, systemically, we have a lot of issues, however, in the mental health world, but sometimes it's just being able to have the conversation, again, being aware of I know how difficult that this transition might be, but let's work together to kind of get you there where you need to go and explaining it to them in a way that makes sense. So I think we will see that the most is knowing when and where to refer. And like Lauren said, it's really important to have a list of places where you know that are you would go yourself essentially um, and refer your clients there if needed. All right, so the importance for counselors. So again, it's really important for us to gain training in trauma-informed care. So um, there's you know, two different um, types of trauma. So there's a single episode traumatic event, which might be you know, like a mugging or an assault or you know, something like experiencing a hurricane or a tornado, like something that just happened once. And then a complex trauma, um, which can be um, which is actually referred to the developmental trauma or the polyvictimization trauma, which was specified in the earlier slide about the different traumas. So it, this is where it's experienced by, you know, children, teens, or, you know, or adults, and that can be, you know, chronic abuse, neglect, um, or exposure to other different harsh environments. 
um, throughout the lifetime. So it's not just a single event that we're traumatized by, it's multiple different events leading up to um, a specific trauma, such as um, what I, I, I like to talk about, you know, reactive attachment disorder within, you know, foster children. So that would be kind of considered a complex trauma with the abuse and neglect that they experienced growing up. Um, so then, you know, having an understanding that trauma-informed care is increasing, so it's becoming more, um, more understood in our society and in our field, you know, having to acknowledge that, you know, approaching a client who's been, tra- you know, who's been traumatized, there's a certain way to do it, and there's, a, there's certain questions that need to be asked that you can honestly get a client to open up further. Um, and, I, and I think down here is asking the right question. So what happened to you versus what is wrong with you? So we don't want to assume something is wrong with the client. We want to you know, further ask you know, what happened, not you know, there's something wrong, because that can be very put off. And then you know, what is wrong with you that might be a trigger to a client and they might regress and not respond further. Um, and then what does trauma mean to you? Kind of asking them what trauma means to them. Um, some people honestly don't recognize that they're a victim. So we need to make sure we ask these questions in a certain way um, because we don't wanna miss an opportunity to have this client open up and recognize further on that they are a victim. Sometimes it takes a lot of time to build that rapport with the client. And then, you know, and then again, assessing, cause you might not know if, you know, it's let, let's say, you know, how it's affecting them. So we wanna make sure that we aren't re-traumatizing them. And it all goes back to re-traumatization with trauma-informed care. That's what we're trying to avoid. Um, and then the last question is, what ways, if any, has your life been different since the trauma? It's just, you know, allowing, the client to kind of have control over their question and not direct, like directing any blame towards them or directing any kind of, um, any kind of thought towards them. So we want to make sure we're open because we don't want to, you know, you know, we don't, we, because people, honestly, people with trauma don't sometimes recognize they have triggers and, you know, something could happen. There could be a smell, there could be something that they hear, something that they see, something that, you know, they feel that could trigger them and, cause them to re-experience that event, um, you know, in certain facial expressions. So um, all those need to be considered. I think one of the things that um, in whenever I did the trauma-informed care training, uh, whenever we were creating it, one of the things that that was really tough for me whenever I was first in the field was just changing the language around, right? And so sometimes our field has gotten much more trauma informed and we we include that in a lot of our classes and we use better language but sometimes for me you know we grow up in a lot of households and people I, I hear a lot of parents say you know if their kid comes over crying it's like what's wrong right and it's kind of like we grow up with that language around that if you're crying or you're upset something's wrong right and so i think even just using like my favorite one on here is really just being able to change the language of like what happened versus what's wrong. And so sometimes we we don't want to always go with the the negative connotation of something happened or or something is wrong, something's bad, something's negative, right? It could be a good thing, right? So I think sometimes it's just being able to check our own language around some of these questions to be able to ask the the better questions. So whenever we look at how do we work with adult clients, so the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about working with specific clients, especially being trauma informed. Um, so there's a lot of different trainings. I'm not going to go over all of these, um, but it, just to put it out there of there's different modalities, there's different trainings. Um, there's a lot of certifications that you can get for, for trauma and cognitive processing and trauma certifications through PESI. Um, those can be all after you're licensed and, and how it works in the field. But whenever you work with adult clients, sometimes it can be a little bit different because they um, sometimes, again, we're going to talk about kids in a minute, but adults have more awareness. Um, they're able to kind of share how they feel or if things feel a little bit different. Um, and they're able to kind of take better stock of the, how they feel emotionally and mentally and physically in the situation. And they're able to express that generally um, 
in a better way so that we have a better idea of what is working and what might we need to adjust. So EMDR, um, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing is a really great um, training that you can get after graduation that kind of focuses really on trauma and focuses on processing through that in a way that is safe and feels safe towards everybody, towards the, the client. Um, and it really focuses, it, it's very um, systemic in how they do that. And so a lot of it is really kind of the starting process is really figuring out like, is this client ready to talk about their trauma? And so sometimes I've worked um, I don't do EMDR, but I've worked with a lot of uh, clinicians who have. And so we talk about for supervision, they talk about, you know, I just don't think that this person is really ready. And so sometimes you will have that with adult clients. They'll be like, I Googled this and I need EMDR and we need to do this. And, you know, I have a client right now who really could use EMDR. Um, but we talk a lot about, are you ready in your life to dedicate, the time and the energy to this, this task and this process and what this is like, because it is, it is dedication. You know, it's, it's not for someone who's just like, oh, I'll come here and I'll show up two months later. Right. It's, it's really a process. Um, prolonged exposure therapy is another one seeking safety, um, emotion regulation, which kind of goes with DBT distress tolerance. Um, and then mindfulness is a big one, which those are all kind of wrapped up in DBT as well. So um, application with child clients. So I work a lot with um, child clients that have gone through some traumas. Um, I previously, um, you know, during my internship, um, when I was in my master's program and after I did work with kids who were in the foster care system and, you know, went through adoption. So it's really important that, you know, you don't only focus on the child, but you focus on the parent, whether they're a foster parent or an adoptive parent or even a, you know, a biological parent as well. Um, you know, you include the parents in the counseling with the child because the parents are going to be the main support for them. So you want to make sure that they're as informed as maybe you are um, to an extent, and then, you know, allowing them to learn different parenting techniques on how to approach their child at home so they can, you know, help prevent re-traumatization as well when they're not in your office. Um, so there's different attachment theory models. Um, so we want to make sure we're knowledgeable of attachment because with, um, with children, you know, if early on, if the attachment is disrupted, that creates trauma in a, in a child within itself. Um, so then there's also trauma focused CBT, which is a really good approach to use with clients. Um, then we have the adverse childhood experience, which is ACEs. Um, so, which is, you know, ACEs is, you know, assessing a traumatic event with, within a child um, from the age of zero to 17. So you want to assess the lasting negative effects of, um, of the trauma that's on the health and well-being of the child. So there's three different categories that I research and recognize. So there's abuse, neglect, which is, I guess is up there too, and household dysfunction. So under abuse, you're going to have physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse. And then under neglect, it's going to be physical and emotional neglect. And then household dysfunction, there's going to be um, mental illness, incarcerated relatives, um, mothers treated violently, substance abuse, and divorce. Um, and then young exposure to trauma could you know, disrupt the child development. So that's again where I want to touch on core beliefs, and this is something I've really gotten into. Um, so understanding that you know either prior to the age of eleven or experiencing a traumatic event, um, children don't have the concept of self versus the world and others. So anything that happens, kids are going to automatically think it's specifically in regards to them. So that's when they internalize and things may occur to where they're going to have that as a belief and internalize that and grow up to thinking maybe like if someone's neglecting them or, you know, you see some sort of abuse and that's what they're experiencing, they're going to internalize that and think that's their fault. So they could think that they're worthless growing up. Um, and that's something that's going to be taken into adulthood. So that's, um, you know, recognizing core beliefs as, um, as a focus on treatment is really important as well. Um, 
So then again, just talking about um, different experiences with um, child services and different um, CPS reports. So it was saying in 2013, 3.9 million children and adolescents were reported to child protective services. So that again is like removal of children from their homes, which is traumatizing within itself, again, with not knowing what they've been removed for. When we talk about application to families, um, again, we, we there's not as much detail on this slide, but again, it's more just like creating an awareness that everyone's a part of a family. Everyone has come from somewhere, right? And so there's a lot of things that happen within families that carries through generation. And so there's generational trauma with what happened 10, 20, 100 years ago, right? So there's a lot of generational trauma that still comes up today. Um, and not that we have to be aware of every historical event that may have impacted families, but we need to be aware that what happened to someone's great grandparents could still affect them today and still does affect them today. Um, functional family therapy is just a different modality along with kind of family therapy in general to kind of look at um, the family and like how the symptoms are of the family, what they're looking at, what is the family's perspective on the trauma. Um, and then specifically around the awareness of anyone that's in the foster system, um, kids who have lost parents growing up in whatever manner that is. Um, I, work, I have a client who lost her mom to cancer whenever she was probably six years old. And she still, you know, talks about that. Like, it's not something she lives with day to day, but there are things that just kind of pop up every once in a while that um, really affects her. Um, and kind of just the idea of the trauma of her family not being, quote unquote, the same as, as other people's or as it was. So looking at it from the family perspective, sometimes it's also when people have experienced trauma, sometimes it's helpful to see who they feel would be helpful to bring into a session, right? So we talked about adults, we talked about kids, um, but everyone has a family, everyone's part of a family, whether it's, you know, biological family or just family of friends, right? So I think it's important to understand, like, do, do we offer a session with the person that you feel like is a support system, right? Sometimes I have clients that say, that say, this is really hard for me. I feel like I want to bring my mom or my dad or my partner into session, right? So, you know, we, we are counselors, but sometimes we also have to wear the hat of a family therapist sometimes. Um, and the last thing we're going to talk about before we kind of get to some questions is application to the field. So, you know, I'm not going to really, we talked about this a lot throughout the presentation, but being able to kind of create, again, having an awareness of all of the things that we kind of talked about today. We need to create a safe environment, not only for clients in our office, but clients even in the um, the, the place that they are, right? Even in the organization, even by the time they walk in the door, do they feel safe? Um, I worked in a building, I worked in two different buildings at the same company. One, you could just open the door and come right in. And the other one, you had to be buzzed in and you had to walk up. And it was very kind of like mechanical and felt very not welcoming. Um, and it had its reasons. But again, from client facing, was that really, a, did that feel like a safe environment? Did it feel somewhere where they wanted to come? Um, engaging clients in organizational aspects. Whenever you're in the field and you work for larger organizations and even insurance companies, organizational aspects can be kind of anything, like getting them involved in creating change for the organization. Um, that's where organizational support comes in. What, what kind of feedback is your organization asking for that might involve the clients? Um, training for both clinical and non-clinical staff. So even people that are security guards, even people at the front desk, even people who are peer supports, all the way up to the, the prescribers need to have training and awareness around that. Um, we talked about collaboration, um, providing different options. You know, sometimes where 
in community mental health or even in private practice or even just in our field in general, wait lists are really long. And so sometimes we can, our, our choice to provide is, well, you could wait a couple months and I might have an opening or availability, or well, you could wait on this wait list for a while. And so sometimes being able to, to let them know that the choices that we're providing them they might not feel the best for us, but sometimes we might not have any other options either. And so I think it's being able to create a conversation around that. Lauren, anything to add on this before we take any questions? Um, no, I mean, I think it's definitely important to train both the clinical and non-clinical staff because there are other people in the office setting, um, whether you know, you're know you at a nonprofit or a private practice or a hospital, wherever you are. And um, some people might choose to engage with you know, maybe different staff that don't have clinical experience. So it's being able to allow them to be informed on how to approach those situations as well. Because I know at my, my job, um, I work at a private practice and we have an intake coordinator at the front desk and we have, you know, the parents sitting there in the waiting rooms talking to them. Um, and she's actually informed. Um, she's a peer, peer counselor. So, um, I mean, she's not fully trained as a clinician in, in trauma, but you know, she's taken trainings on how to approach, um, how to approach these parents and maybe these kids um, that are waiting in the waiting room. So it goes a long way with the environment that you're in as well. So it's important to make sure that everyone's aware and trained. Does anyone have any questions as we kind of wrap up? I think we have about five minutes left. Comments? No questions? Sounds good to me. If anyone has anything, you could reach out um, and we will somehow get you the PowerPoint if we possibly can. I'm looking at Daenerys and she's not looking at me because she's in charge here and she knows, but. I'm sorry, um, I was looking at Crystal's comment. <laughs> <laughs> we, will, we will get the PowerPoint out if anyone needs it, just, just let us know. But it was, thank you. We appreciate you coming. Have a good rest of your Thank Friday. you so much.